Thank you very much uh, for attending in our final conference, Melikos final conference. Uh, it's a great honor to have you as participants. It's a great honor to have such esteemed uh, panelists and uh, we will start right away. Also a big uh, thank you to the online participants, uh, the ones that are providing us with their time via the Zoom application. Uh, the idea is that after the, the final conference you will all receive minutes as well as the recordings of the conference. Before we start and before I give the, the floor to uh, Patelis Velanas, the project coordinator from European University of Cyprus, I would like to say that uh, of course the meeting is being recorded and by your participation as I understand you fully agree with, with that fact. But in any case we will provide you the minutes and the recording in advance so that you can let us know if you have any issues or any problems about that, uh, the recording. Uh, in addition to that, you have probably already received a, bag, uh, a, a baggage, a gift from, from us, which contains this booklet. The booklet actually has the agenda of today's meeting, as well as uh, the panelists, the names, as well as the affiliations. So please feel free to, to go through it and uh, find out all about the, today's agenda, uh, as well as our speakers and participants. Uh, we will have two coffee breaks as well as a lunch break after the very first presentation. And besides that, I would really like to thank my colleagues, uh, Vicky, Danai and Aneta for pretty much, uh, and of course, Padelis and Christiana for organizing uh, such, and all partners for organizing uh, the final uh, project conference of Medicos. So, Padelis, please feel free to come up and take the floor. Hello. Thanks a lot, Babis and VI Labs, for organizing this the final event of Medicos. Uh, I would like to thank also the representatives of uh, European agencies, uh, Giulio, Solon, uh, representatives also from EU Lisa. Uh, I can say that, uh, let's say today we are celebrating Medicos. Uh, we have, let's say, Medicos is concluding its activities uh, in five days. It was a nice experience for me, but also for all partners, I think, I hope. Uh, we have some problems because our project, it was uh, in the middle of COVID, but uh, we managed as a team to bypass the issues and the barriers. And now we are happy to present you the results that we have and also the pilots. Uh, I will try to provide before uh, I will try to provide a short a brief uh, about Medicos. Our today's agenda, first. Uh, we organized this meeting in uh, four different sessions. The first session focused on the technical outcomes of Medicos. We will present uh, in detail, let's say, our solutions and, uh, and, uh, the, demo and the results from our demonstrations. Uh, in the next panel, we have also two panels, one that will focus on the EU border control landscape and another one that it will focus on the connection between the innovation activities and the businesses in Europe. And in the last session, we will have a discussion regarding the BS cluster. Uh, BS cluster is a cluster that initiated by Medicos and we are happy to inform you that many, many projects from the, board, from the border management area is part of that. Our thing is to continue this cluster after Medicos. And today we will begin, let's say, some activities. We will discuss with the partners of uh, best cluster and we will uh, define an agenda for the next months. About Medicos. Uh, Medicos began its activities in the 1st of September 2020. We are 15 partners. We have five border authorities on board. Uh, this project addresses the objectives of the topic SUBS01, human factors and social, societal and organizational aspects of border and external security. And our mission is to build uh, a toolkit in order to measure the technical acceptance and societal acceptance by border authorities and travelers uh, that using uh, modern border control technologies. Here is, let's say, the geographical distribution of our partners. 
as you may see, we try to cover all uh, dimensions of Europe. We have partners from the North Europe, from South Europe, East and West. As I already mentioned, what we do with Medicos is to build models and uh, technologies to support the technology act to, to predict and estimate the acceptance of modern border technologies, of uh, border control technologies by travelers and staff. Also, we manage to somehow, let's say, measure the, the societal acceptance. And I say uh, I we try to do that because we have also some ethical constraints. We will discuss this later. And also, with our solution, we are provide, we are promoting the trust of using these technologies, not only to the travelers, but also to the border authorities. It is something that we, we see during our project, that also the border authorities need to trust that the new technologies that they are planning to use or they are currently using. What we do is to introduce digital technologies in order to do that. Our technologies needs data, needs data from the field. Uh, so it was mandatory to include in our solution big data technologies, uh, algorithms, data fusion algorithms to see how we will collect and exploit the raw data that we collect. And also, uh, we try to build algorithms in order to make this data valuable and to provide, a, let's say, a decision support, let's say, dashboard to the users. Okay. The main components of Medicos is the Technology, are the technology acceptance models, the social sensing toolkit, the big data engine, the middleware that connects our platform with the border uh, control uh, points, and also a VR toolkit that this become part of Medicos later. We will provide uh, details about that in the next slides. Uh, focusing, as I said, on the, let's say, Focusing on, let's say, building a, a holistic approach able to be uh, adapted and configured in any BCP point, including uh, airports, uh, ports, and land borders. This is a high-level architecture. Uh, as you may see, it's a, a five-level approach. We emphasize on the data sources and data management of, uh, in, uh, in, this, in our solution. The middle layer is the medical intelligence, which includes the technology and social acceptance uh, models, the filtering of outcomes, and of course the data visualization, a tool that it is valuable for our users. Regarding the ethical requirements, we try to address. Uh, as I mentioned, we have issues on how we will, we will collect data from the field, Thus, we decide to not collect data from cameras, not collect data from biometric components, not, uh, we will not collect data from real travel, travel documents, and also uh, we will not be able to connect our solution with working databases as VIS, SIS, so on. In that way, we position our project in a minimal risk, uh, as, as a minimal risk, but on the other hand, uh, we, we noticed that we have problems on, we didn't have sufficient information in order uh, to validate our models. So in that way, we decide to use uh, structured information, uh, in, so, uh, structured information, and uh, we decide to include to involve VR technology in our solution in order to collect uh, simulated information. This is our platform. Uh, as you may see, we try to connect our solution with the border uh, control uh, equipment. The problem was in the cycles. The problem was on the interaction between 
the existing uh, BCP systems and our solution. So, for that reason, we, we decided to use VR toolkit. The timeline, in the first 18 months, we focused on the design and development of our solution. Also, we had extended discussions regarding the ethical requirements, which solved, finally. We have three ethical advisory board meetings in, uh, during the medical's uh, duration. And in the second half of the project, we focus our activities on the integration and, of course, on the pilots. As you may see, we have pilot in five uh, different countries, in Estonia, Cyprus, Greece, Romania, and Austria. What we did in the pilots, in the pilots uh, we evaluate our solution, we evaluate the processes we are using in three different scenarios, air, land, and sea borders. We evaluate the te technological acceptance and the social acceptance uh, uh, and the social acceptance on the current technologies. And of course, we demonstrate uh, our, our solution. This is an outline of our pilot, uh, our pilot activities. As I said in the, in the beginning, the collection of, of data, uh, it was crucial for our project. So we decided to have two different kind of pilots to have demonstrations on the fields, but also we organize uh, data collection pilots, surveys. We have a one pan-European survey with, in which we managed to collect, if I remember uh, well, 8,000 questionnaires. So we have 8,000 answers in our uh, questionnaire. We interact with the best cluster uh, and with all border management projects in order to exchange information on the matter. And also, we try to collect information from the social networks. On the other hand, we organize uh, field trials. We share uh, questionnaires to the participants of the trials. We have an uh, online questionnaire for everybody. We have posters uh, in all uh, uh, demonstration areas. I think that currently we, have, we still have posters, so we are giving to all travelers to connect uh, the opportunity to connect with our questionnaire and to provide feedback on their interaction with the modern border control technologies. And, <coughs> and we will do that until, I think, uh, the end of the project. Regarding the pilots, I will not provide many details as uh, we have a session for this. We have a pilot uh, in Estonia, in Target, a pilot in uh, uh, Athens Airport, Eleftherios Venizelos, Cyprus, Larnaca Airport, in Romania, the Misoara Land Border con uh, Control Point, and of course in Vienna, in the 17th of August, in the, uh, Ost in the Vienna Airport. This is for me, I think. Uh, I tried to present briefly uh, the progress of Metic the outcomes of Meticos. Also, I try to be in line with the timeline. It's okay. I, we are three minutes ahead. So now I'm calling uh, our technical partners to provide details for their solutions. The first partner is Nikos Ioannidis. Nikos Ioannidis from VUB. Hello. VUB is our ethical regulatory partner. They did, uh, they provided significant effort in our project as we have many ethical requirements to address. Good morning, everyone. Um, maybe you don't know me because um, normally it should have been Frank here, but uh, due to a constraint, he couldn't come to present the part of VUB. However, we worked with Frank together uh, on the data protection impact assessment and the human rights impact assessment. So I can take his part now and present this one. Um, I will first start with the data protection impact assessment. Uh, as you know, whenever there is a processing activity with personal data, uh, which might show high risk to the freedoms and rights of um, users, uh, a specific exercise after the GDPR has to be carried out, which is the data protection impact assessment um, with a certain methodology and um, a specific outcome. So in brief, 
it is an accountability tool or a process uh, which has been designed for um, the description of the processing, the assessment of the necessity and proportionality to rights and freedoms of uh, natural persons on their personal data. Um, and then a tool in order to, pro to propose mitigation measures for these risks which might um, rise. Uh, therefore, is uh, in some an anterior control exercise. It's an ex-ante tool. It comes be before the processing activities. Um, and here, specifically for the Meticos platform, uh, you have to bear in mind that it does not, uh, in fact, uh, assess the risks of the no-gate crossing point solutions, but it, uh, it provides a forum because it's... Um, you have to describe the processing operations for the uh, toolkit. Um, therefore, uh, there have been three steps. First, to map the data flows, uh, which will be presented in the next slides of the Medicos platform. Uh, second, and most important, to identify the privacy and data protection risks. But on all, not only these ones, but these are the main risks, uh, which uh, give rise to other ones. And the third one is to to control, to, so to suggest measures and formulate recommendations on how to mitigate these risks. Uh, which methodology has been followed for that uh, from CNIL, which is the Data Protection Authority of France and has long ago provided a very solid and robust methodology for uh, DPIA, not for research specifically, but in general for high risk processing operations, but also uh, this one is inspired by another project which was before Meticos and specifically provided the methodology for uh, technologies uh, in not yet crossing point solutions in border control, which was named uh, Persona. Um, therefore, the data sources during the pilots were um, split in primary and secondary. Um, as we have said in the first presentation, there have been some questionnaires about uh, the crossing points. Uh, the social media Twitter platform has been used for that. Uh, a mobile application and a tablet application. But these are only the primary data. In secondary, we have uh, statistical data from uh, broader crossing points, uh, from uh, no social networks, and uh, some online reviews uh, on blogs and websites. Here, it's a bit complicated to explain to you the data flow diagram, but I think the most important part is to, to see uh, which are the data sources. So questionnaires, Twitter, um, the mobile application, the tablet application, uh, we, these are the, the source of data. Then um, it's the technical part mostly and where the actual uh, assessment takes place in order to produce the result. So, yes, again, in practice, the data collected include, but are not limited to, uh, the time to cross the, the traveler's demographics and profile, um, the staff member demographics and profile, the tweets. I I'm not going to go through all of them, but you can see that there have been many data uh, which have uh, fed into the data protection impact assessment. Uh, to that, uh, we took uh, into consideration some principles, which are known as the data protection principles. Uh, and then these have to be embedded in the whole exercise, in the DPIA. Uh, one of them, the very important, is the purpose limitation, uh, also named as function creep, which is uh, data which have been collected for one purpose, but then it can be subsequently used for another person. Uh, in the first presentation, we said that we're not collecting data from some sources. Uh, inter alia camera for behavior and motion detection from tower documents, etc. Another important principle which, principle which um, uh, is included is the data minimization. This means that uh, only necessary data are collected. Uh, and some have to be non-personal, so have been anonymized. Um, so the strict necessity principle. A, a third one, very important, is the transparency uh, to ensure uh, control of data subjects uh, on personal data. 
And this has been uh, affected by active participation of users um, and by uh, anonymization and other techniques. Uh, we also took care of the security, which uh, is affected by storing data on Matico servers and not elsewhere. So this was the first part. This was the data protection impact assessment, which is a, an exercise mandated by uh, the data protection reformed framework after 2016 in various instruments, including the GDPR. Now, uh, the second part of the exercise is the human rights impact assessment, or also called the fundamental rights impact assessment, which is not any obligatory exercise for the moment. However, uh, there have been trends uh, recently to include such exercise in the Artificial Intelligence Act, uh, but it's not uh, final yet. Therefore, we don't have any final provision of obligation of human rights impact assessment. What is it? Uh, it's a complementary exercise, I would say. So the DPIA, the first one, has some limits, some limitations also. Um, to data protection risks and privacy risks um, of high level, which might also present risks uh, to natural persons um, and their personal data processing. Uh, now, this is broader because it also includes ethical risks. Uh, also, it can include societal risks. And um, it can also include other rights which are not uh, involved, such as uh, the fundamental right to non-discrimination, the fundamental right uh, to fair trial, uh, the fundamental freedoms uh, of religion, conscience, uh, freedom of information, everything it can include. Uh, so it's a broad exercise, which means that it cannot be easily reproduced. There is no certain methodology yet for that um, by any supervisor authority, by any... Um, Institute. There are some are targeted to the private sector, some targeted for national use, but there is no pan-European one. Uh, so, uh, as you know, the project uh, has a specific mission. Uh, by that, uh, there have been identifications of risks, uh, not only for data protection and privacy, but also, and you see on the top and the bottom right, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom of movement, prohibition of discrimination, right to liberty, consent, religion. These are fundamental rights uh, in a European level. They are protected not only by national uh, constitutions, but also by the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Therefore, uh, since um, the project has a pan-European uh, effect, uh, these rights have to be protected uh, under the scope of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Mm. Yes. Uh, so our methodology has been uh, split in four steps. Uh, first has been the identification of border technologies, which is very normal, uh, which traces back to the DPIA as it would have been the identification of processing operations, but now we have the identification of border technologies. The description of the medical system in the DPIA would have been the description of technical and contextual uh, operations. Uh, the second step is the impact on fundamental rights. So we first identify who is impacted, and then we identify by what means. So which rights uh, are impacted uh, on that person or group of persons. The third step is the core part of the human rights impact assessment. It's the evaluation of impacts. Uh, but um, this is a very difficult exercise, very subjective. Uh, but again, this does not refer specifically to the crossing point solutions, but uh, on the toolkit as well. And fourth is the formulation of mitigation measures. If we didn't have that, we wouldn't need to carry out such exercise. This is the utmost uh, objective of this exercise, to understand what we are doing, which human rights are impacted, and uh, the risks, of course and then to document and present uh, solutions, uh, mitigation measures, remedial actions. Um, there are two scopes, yes. Um, the human rights concerns deriving from the use of border control technologies, uh, which is the broader one, uh, and we all know that the collection of uh, biometric data 
uh, might have uh, adverse effects on uh, rights and freedoms to data subjects because there are there is processing of very sensitive data um, not very, they are called special categories of data and they are sensitive biometrics such as facial image free fingerprints but also there is the problem with the interoperability which is a new one uh, of um, centralized IT systems uh, these are some of the databases uh, for border control management uh, and the second part which is an um, second layer I would call uh, there are human rights concerns deriving from the Medicus platform what we developed here uh, some risks are and the using of can emanate from the facial emotion recognition um, but it hasn't mitigated uh, risks uh, co from collecting data from uh, official border control databases it's very important uh, because we we actually skipped that uh, we didn't uh, collect that uh, confidentiality breaches uh, from travels data but also from border guard staff data which is people who are also included in this um, exercise not only the travelers it's also the people who work uh, in border control authorities um, and then there are biases in the mitigation uh, sorry there are biases in the representation and in the pilots um, but um, there have been some uh, consistent efforts to identify and mitigate the bias of AI uh, I will show you in, in the last slide um, so who is impacted apart from the, uh, the apart from the um, uh, border control staff travelers who some subcategories of travelers and these are impacted and that's why we do this exercise because they are citizens of the EU and we have to do it and so these people have the fundamental rights because they circulate around the EU uh, but also third country nationals uh, who are affiliated with uh, an EU citizen or the European Economic Area citizen or Switzerland, uh, but also third country nationals who have some kind of uh, legal relation with um, uh, our uh, European Union and European Economic Area, uh, applicants of visa, for example, and refugees, of course. Uh, we see that now with um, uh, some ways of refugees as well. Um, Factors potentially impacting travelers, a series of factors, but these are some very specific examples. I would say for a complete human rights impact assessment, you would need way more uh, factors uh, to, to mention. Um, yes. So the methodology for the human rights impact assessment, as I told you, doesn't exist. So that's another innovation of this project to provide an early level um, uh, human rights impact assessment for border control technologies but also for a platform uh, used to assess, to assess the societal acceptance for these technologies. Our sources are the high level expert group on AI, the ethical guidelines which dates back to uh, the early conceptualization of the AI Act. And then secondly it's the AI Act, the proposal on itself which is about to be consolidated in a few months, um, hopefully. And third was the NIST um, a document on uh, identifying and managing bias for AI. Um, okay, so this is the last slide, I think, but uh, it comprises a comprehensive, uh, detailed uh, overview of what bias could be included uh, when developing AI solutions and using AI solutions. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, but uh, bias normally is the deviation of, um, in, in, the legal, in the legal notion, not the technical one. What we call bias is the deviation of um, um, a perception of different people on a specific topic, I would say. Uh, it's... Um, there is no, of course, there is no uh, definition in the legal term of on what is bias, but uh, it's related to uh, AI uh, mostly, um, and it's uh, the subjectivity by which uh, a person can assess different things. So, the, in the impact assessment, where are, there are human agents who assess, it's very important not to have bias uh, in representation and um, other bias as well. 
Um, I think, yes, this ends the presentation. Thank you very much. And I remain for questions. Thank you very much, Nikos. Uh, indeed, a universal uh, definition of bias would be something great. However, we have to adapt according to each project every single time, but that's okay as well. Uh, so next presenter will be Bruno Galdo from AIT. So please feel free. You can come from here. Thanks. So, hi, my name is Bruno. I'm from AIT and I will try to uh, present uh, the, the ETEP module, what would be called the ETEP module, uh, and what the abbreviation means. So it's embedded technology acceptance prediction. Uh, I will present how it was built and what it consists from uh, very briefly. As the name suggests, uh, it predicts the acceptance of, of uh, given border control technology by travelers, but not only by travelers, but also uh, by the border control staff. So actually, uh, we have two modules uh, down there, uh, buried in the middleware. Uh, the, the, the module itself uh, covers different technologies, uh, ranging from, from e-gates to, to fingerprint scanners to, to very basic passport scanners. Uh, it is enabled by technology acceptance modeling, which uh, is not an easy task to do because it is uh, influenced by many different uh, by many different factors such as cultural orientation, technology related aspects, and so on. Uh, and the models uh, are usually have to be based on on, on uh, ground through data, uh, so we had to collect quite a large sample of data to to be able to to, to create a meaningful models. Uh, what is the innovation and value of the ETA module? Uh, it, it enables end users, such as policymakers, planners, shift managers, and so on, to, to make better decisions when utilizing the, the border control technologies. And uh, the acceptance predictions actually supports uh, also uh, many different strategies, uh, such as assessment of, of acceptability of installations of new technologies uh, at the border control points, uh, predictions for, for stakeholders, uh, uh, investigation of driving factors behind the acceptance, and uh, also the prediction of the impact if, uh, if something changes at the border control points. What is the innovation uh, value of, of, of this module? Uh, it covers a wide range of technologies, as I mentioned before. Uh, we tried to, to model um, predictions of five different technologies. Uh, we did extensive user research to, to be able to, 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 to come up with a reasonable technology acceptance model. And uh, it has been uh, designed for, uh, for quantitative uh, acceptance prediction. Uh, what it takes to to do the technology acceptance modeling, uh, we try to, to to map different factors to a single number. Uh, that's the behavioral intention to use. That's the actual, actual acceptance uh, of the technology. But uh, it is influenced by many different aspects, uh, which can be grouped into three different categories, such as cultural orientation, technology-related aspects, and user characteristics. Uh, only the technology-related uh, aspects, there are many different factors which, which influence uh, those, such as there, there are a variety of expectations uh, regarding the te technology. It's the ease of use of technology, impact on privacy, whether the user trusts the technology or not, uh, uh, what, what are his expectations regarding the, the performance of the technology. Uh, not only that, but there are some uh, cultural, cu cultural aspects, uh, such as uh, uncertain, uh, uncertainty avoidance, uh, masculinity, long-term orientation, and then, uh, of course, user-related aspects, uh, such as the, the history of, of, of traveling, 
uh, previous experience with the smart board and control, um, control technologies. And uh, for example, also the, the trust in border control authority. To, to be able to do uh, technology acceptance modeling, we had to, uh, to, 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 to uh, conduct many, uh, many surveys or to, to gather broad aspect of data, which has been divided into three surveys. First was the pilot survey, uh, where we gathered uh, more than 400 points. That was, that was the starting point to to get an overview of what kind of a data we are working on and to prepare for for the larger batches in the in the main survey as we can see in the uh, as it was mentioned before in the main survey we collected more than uh, 8000 data points from eight uh, european countries uh, and at the end there was also a staff which uh, offered the data for for the for the technology acceptance model for, for, the, board, uh, for the staff model. I will just briefly uh, show example of the results, what we got from, from the surveys. So this is just a very, very simple example of the influence of the age on the behavioral intention to use. So that's the actual acceptance. So how it is influenced by the, by the age uh, and different technology. So there is a significant differences between age groups. For example, we can see that the, the, the elderly people are represented by a far uh, lower group of people in comparison to the, to the youth generation. And there are also a significant uh, differences in perception of, of acceptance of the technology. Uh, we also discovered in, in the surveys or by, by analyzing the survey that there are factors without a significant difference. For example, the trust in border control authorities, uh, the collectivis uh, collectivism, and uh, also uh, many factors which we expected to have a larger uh, impact on the technology acceptance uh, didn't have such a, such, a, such a huge impact at the end. Uh, I will show also a very brief overview of the survey results for the staff uh, acceptance factors. Uh, we can see here that, the, again, the, the B2 value, that's the beha behavioral intention to use, that's the acceptance, that's the, the factor influencing the acceptance. Uh, there are mainly four uh, driving factors which influence those. That's the per per performance expectancy, expected ease of use. Uh, facilitating conditions and expected uh, output quality. quality. So th those have the, the largest uh, correlation with, with the acceptance and that's why those are the driving factors behind the actual tex uh, technology acceptance model. Uh, on this slide there is a, there is a uh, brief over you have the actual ETAP module uh, looks like. It's, it's deeply integrated into the Medicus platform. Uh, it uh, communicates with the Medicus middleware. Everything is built as a microservice. It's behind the, 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 the containers in Docker and uh, all the technologies which we use are basically one of the mostly used uh, in, in the world currently. Uh, be it the, the, the Node.js and uh, Python for modeling, R for, for, for modeling, and so on. Uh, and now, uh, the actual ETAP module, that's, that's something which is deeply hidden in the middleware, but there is also a front-end application or dashboard which uh, works with, the, with, with, the, with this module and which actually offers the, the, the decision makers to, to get the value or get get the 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 selling the the, the opportunity how uh, to, to use it for for prediction of the technologies and now i will not show the video because uh, i didn't like it so much <laughs> i better present the actual result of our work so that's the application which is part uh, of the medicus platform so it's the uh, it's embedded in the front-end application of medical system. Okay, unfortunately, the 
resolution is kind of yeah yeah I, I will work with that it's no problem so uh, th this is the actual ETAP dashboard uh, which consists of three different parts so that's the basically the first part is is, is, is to show to show the actual uh, real data which has been gathered via the travel and question, travelers questionnaire so to have a brief overview what what kind of a data is already stored and uh, what can be used for for comparison with some simulated data uh, to to make a better better decision so the first part is the real real data the the second part is uh, for basically offering to the to the end user to to be able to to simulate expected uh, group of travelers so Imagine the scenario that uh, we are at the, at the border, border control point and uh, we know that in the past we had certain group of travelers which uh, basically, which, which, uh, uh, which produces a certain acceptance of the, of different technologies. And now we have to decide that we have an upcoming uh, arrival of, of plane with uh, 200, uh, 200 uh, passengers. We can put the number here. And we have to do some assumptions about these travelers. Uh, what, what is their uh, expected convenience? It's, it's, it's really hard to, to, to see from here, sorry. Uh, we have to do some assumptions about this, this incoming group of passengers. So uh, whether they have some, uh, uh, some low expectations uh, uh, of, of convenience of use or, or high or, or, or medium. So we can change that and enable the simulated values. So below the, this switch we can see what, what would be the actual simulated uh, histogram of, of passengers, so what would be the actual data points used to, to, uh, to be sent to the ETAB module and to produce the expect, uh, resulting uh, expected resulting utilization. We can change also uh, different factors which are influencing the technology acceptance modeling and the predictions, and uh, everything will be basically then translated uh, into the final decision making tool which is the expected resulting utilization so we will see what is the expected uh, utilization of different technologies and the decision makers based on this uh, these inputs can make a decision okay it's uh, it's viable to to open for example uh, the, the e gates or more gates with face recognition or the users which are upon arrival to, to the airport uh, would prefer the, the basic passport scanners much more, so uh, it makes sense to open more passport scanner gates. Unfortunately, it seems that the internet connection is kind of slow here, so it's not fully interactive, but it's working. Either you can, you can access it on the, on the actual platform, on the front end, uh, meticos, uh, simavi so it, it's fully working there, uh, or in the meantime, you can just uh, come to me and I will happily present it to you. Uh, the, the part of the technology acceptance modeling as well is, is, since we are working with the interactive model, it is important to also do some, some, some changes in, 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 in the time to it. So. Uh, we embedded also the drift detection of the model, so whether the, the, the predicted values of the model actually are still reasonable in the time, and if they are not reasonable, uh, we can show it that there, there is a slight drift for, for different factors, and if there is a drift, there is a slight recommendation, there is a recommendation at the bottom, okay, you either have to or don't have to uh, update the model files, which you can do in the model management uh, tab here where you have a very simple uh, administration or management of, of existing models so there is for, for the 
for the administrator of the of the system, there is a way how to change the models and how to update them. Those. And that would be all from from my side. All right, everything works now. Thanks. Super. Thank you very much. If you don't have any comments or questions, then we can question, okay? Yeah, I was wondering, um, based on what would an end user make these assumptions, is this something that end users have to come up with themselves, or is there any data points for that? Uh, it's, it's based uh, mostly on experience, on, on mostly on the data which, we, uh, which they already have, so... Uh, at the first part, there is an overview, or they, they, they know the, the basic crowd or basic statistics of what they work with. And then, based on uh, the data which they have, but we can't access, uh, mm -hmm. so that the, the, those are the secondary sources of the data which we can't use in the system, they, can, they have an access to, to, to this data, and they can uh, build... Uh, some kind of uh, expectations or assumptions about the incoming users, and they can use it in, in, in the system. Yeah. So border authorities actually do have data on, let's say there is a plane incoming from Berlin, Germany, and they have data on Germans' expected they, ease they, of use is like... No, that's just uh, based on experience. Yeah. Ah, okay. They, they so we all know data. Germans are very skeptical, so we Probably, put low. Yes. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you very much. That would be probably all. Because I was, as I was also informed, questions are for the very end of the presentation, as my colleague clearly pointed out to me. So please keep your hands raised. Giuseppe, thank you very much in advance, but let's keep the questions for the very end. Um, end of the presentation so that we can give uh, a very good presentation of the overall solutions and then uh, to see uh, what open points and questions we have. I will, other, if Padelis doesn't really want to add something because he's the moderator and the only one who can actually make questions and comments for now, I will give the screen floor, mic, pretty much everything to you and, uh, and our colleagues, uh, Sule and Sarang, who are going to present uh, their part in the medical solution. So thank you very much in advance. Let's wait for them. So hello everyone. This is Shule Yildirim Yayılgan uh, from Norwegian University of Science and Technology. We have been working on the development of the uh, social sensing toolkit. So uh, the purpose of the social sensing toolkit is to monitor and uh, predict technology acceptance at the borders, particularly land borders and airports. And it comprises of three components. The first component is the sociocultural framework uh, module. The other one is the data processing module. And the third one is the agent-based modeling and simulation uh, module. And here we, uh, we predict technology acceptance. And this can be done over time and in real time, and in the end, we will use this monitoring and or we use this monitoring and prediction to be able to provide knowledge and recommendation to the stakeholders. And the data sources we are using here are online social networks, our pilots, and uh, border crossing uh, technology requirements, uh, and did I miss anything, Sarang? These are the data sources. So what we do is uh, we extract profiles of the travelers uh, and we match the profiles of the travelers to the perceptions of the travelers, which we collect from our data sources. And then we put this as input to the agent-based modeling and simulation uh, component such that we can create different scenarios of uh, real-time uh, situation of the borders. Uh, and uh, we have tested this on five pilots.
So the medical social sensing toolkit is to uh, understand and uh, predict acceptance of the BCPs uh, done using the individual profile of travelers and the uh, perceptions of the travelers. And the technology acceptance decisions are made in the form of binary accepted, not accepted, or we can provide ratings, for example, from zero to one. And the acceptance are in the form of emotions, such as, can also be in the form of emotions, such as happy, sad, angry, positive, negative. And all this acceptance can be used to enhance and improve the border control process and to be able to use the resources effectively at the border crossing points. And uh, so then we can manage the traveler flow at the uh, borders in a more smooth way and efficient way. And then we can also plan the availability of the border guards at the borders, but then we keep or maintain the reliability and resilience in a way of the border crossing point technologies. Can we move on? Yes, and so the data sources, one of the data sources uh, we used was uh, Twitter. We collected data from the Twitter academic API. We were lucky uh, at that time this was free, but now it costs. We used keywords such as uh, border biometrics, e-gaze, BCP technology, automated border control, and so on, when we were collecting data from the API. The data was collected between 2011 and 2022. We have filtered links and retweets. That means we haven't used them. Uh, we have used approximately 36,000 uh, instances. And we have used the fields of tweet ID, language, tweet date, tweet text, and location. So this way we were able to train this perception architecture. And then, uh, then that means we have the profiles extracted, perceptions extracted from the Twitter, and we have created these pairs that we have used to feed into the data processing module for training. So maybe you will also give the details. Yeah. So hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. So. Uh, taking over from here because we started first with the data collection and data processing from the social media due to the fact that uh, we did not have any ground truth data available at that time for processing or performing any experiments with the social sensing toolkit. So considering this part, we started with Twitter and uh, uh, because we have perception extraction module there as well. So this data help, helped us to train the perception extraction module such that in a way, uh, because there are no ground truth data also available for sentiments and emotions to extract sentiment and emotions of users from the tweet text they are writing about their experiences during their travel journeys, especially for, the, uh, for their use of border control technologies. So when we perform a couple of initial experiments with the with the Twitter data. So you can see that we had actually, uh, this is, I think, I don't know if it is visible or not. This is about the performance metric of the model that we used with this uh, Twitter data for perception extraction and the technology acceptance score prediction. So the model we trained got a very low score error, low error and as compared to other state of the art models. And then the other graphs are actually the examples of how we are doing profile and perceptions pairs. And out of those profile and perceptions, how we are taking out different technology acceptance scores, let's say average, min, max, as per different locations and as per different age and gender groups as well. So this was the very first experience experiment that we did with the social sensing toolkit from the Twitter data. And then some of the examples that we understand that can be used as a extracted knowledge for the border authorities from uh, this data to understand that how this average technology acceptance score varies between uh, people from EU countries and from non-EU or third country nationals, how this score varies 
on social media platform uh, with different age and gender groups. So we have one example as well that we can, from the analysis, we find that age group with 24, 5 to 34 have higher technology acceptance score as compared to the same age group from the uh, third country or non-EU uh, country people. Then the next stage of the data collection came where we entered into the time where we started with the pilots for the Meticos project. So this was the beneficial time for us with the toolkit because this was the chance to get some or to collect some ground tooth data as well. So what we did, we designed a several technology acceptance questionnaire which was deployed online on the Meticos platform during all the five pilots. And the purpose was to use that questionnaire as a ground tooth data for the social sensing toolkit and also for the evaluation of the performance of SST. So you, the pilots run from January uh, 23 to August and uh, uh, for this then we also enhanced our input and output attributes as well for creating profile and perception pair for the social sensing toolkit. So we not only considered in the profile gender age, but we have additional attributes as well, like the familiarity of the participants with the technology, their travel frequency, their existing travel experience with the technology. And then we also included some operational attributes as well, which was uh, uh, added in the social toolkit as a technology requirements. So we considered some operational like waiting time, queue length, response time of the technology while uh, the traveler is interacting with it and number of successful or unsuccessful attempts by the traveler while using the technology and the overall time to cross the border as well using that specific technology. So with this part, this is an example of a questionnaire that we designed and I can also show it uh, online as well. So this was the questionnaire that the past participants were asked to use and then we trained a couple of, because the data sample was quite low, so we did not uh, proceed towards more advanced models. We just stick to some basic machine learning model for training the data because the number of samples was quite low, around 140. So this shows a series of experiments that we have been doing iteratively uh, with different uh, pilots. So we started with some ground to data, then the data from Estonian pilot, then data from Greece pilot came in, then data from the rest of the pilots. So in the end, we added, ended up this 140 sample. And we, when we tested around 77 samples out of this data, we were reasonably able to reach 82% of the accuracy for the best model that we identified as per available data. So this was the procedure that we followed at the pilots that participants were asked to fill that technology acceptance questionnaire after uh, using the technology. Then that data is sent to the Metigos middleware in the database and the Metigos social sensing toolkit retrieves that data from the middleware. And so this whole process was actually linked uh, automatically and uh, deployed in real time at the pilot sites. And then as soon as social sensing toolkit uh, process that full data. Uh, it was again, the data was sent back to the middleware and that social sensing toolkit dashboard, which I will show later, uh, was linked with that uh, extractions and predictions, which all, which were all processed by social sensing toolkit. That dashboard was linked real time and as soon as with each participant going on and submitting the questionnaire, all the processing was done and the officers at the pilots were able to see the decisions changing and the percentages changing on the dashboard in real time settings. So if we link it to the uh, further next step, so if that questionnaire is used by different border authorities to understand their, uh, how the acceptance is going on on their BCP, if they can have some experiment like this or some activity like this, the travelers fill this questionnaire and dashboard is already there, so it can, if you enrich or enhance it with more data, it can give you uh, more results and more insights as per your situation, as per specific BCP situation. Same, the same step goes here as well for, from the pilots. Uh, we also tried to extract knowledge and we also reported 
what we identified from the analysis that how the sentiments of the people, emotions of the people, and then uh, how these operational attributes especially. So what we identified from pilot data that uh, where the participants overall, where the waiting time was less than 30 seconds, there the acceptance score was in the good range, near reaching to four or five. And when the waiting time is greater than or equal to 30 seconds, it was affecting and acceptance score was actually going down to one or two. So this was from the operational attributes. We also mapped a couple of other attributes as well, and we already documented all these results. The third final thing is actually this agent-based simulation model. So what we did, because we have only 140 samples from the pilots, and we cannot cover whole scenarios or we cannot cover whole kind of values for those attributes. So what we did based on the information from, uh, with the help of uh, other partners, we designed a scenario of uh, crossing a BCP in a simulation, simulated environment, where what we did, uh, the trained model that is trained on those 40 samples, we integrated that predicted model into the simulation, and then we run the simulation with the uh, numbers generating inside that environment, and we are predicting the score for the technology acceptance based on the numbers which are being generated in the simulation. So I will show the video. So let's say uh, for waiting time five minutes, we were not able to sim get any answer because it was not a data point into the into that 140 sample. But if we in the simulation put that waiting time as a five minutes, we can see how it can impact the overall acceptance of the technology through that design model. So that is very helpful for the BCPs in terms of seeing unseen situations or if they want to design or improve their uh, processes, how they put their, the numbers as per their need and see what is happening at the in, in the simulated environment and take the necessary measures. We had also a couple of publications so far out of our work uh, in the social sensing toolkit, and uh, few are more to come. And uh, some of the knowledge or recommendations for the stakeholders that we understood uh, that can be used, uh, that we suggested based on the results insights, what we extracted from social sensing toolkit was to implement, let's say, language assistant programs for traveler groups with lower technology acceptance such that they can get more information on this part, and any specific or tailored information or guidance uh, based on traveler demographics, because we see that demographics has a good, has a good impact on ex being acceptance going high or low from our results. And then using real-time data analysis and these agent-based simulation experiments to efficiently allocate resources and uh, uh, at, at the BCPs, enhancing communications for especially for the waiting times and procedures at the current situation and then try to improve social and technology acceptance for especially for low acceptance traveler group based on these different measures which are suggested so this was the dashboard with social sensing toolkit which was linked in real time and as soon as new data points were coming into the db it was processed and uh, the numbers were being updated here so even if now if you submit the form the numbers can uh, be changed and reflected here as well. So we tried to visualize for a specific that was let's say related to pilot situation. So from the pilot, how the age group is being uh, uh, variating for different travelers and their combination with the gender attribute as well, then education level. Then we also see the distribution of familiarity with the technology between these demographics, gender and age group then how their travel experience is with the previous, previous experience with the technology. Then we had the section of this operational attributes due to the size, it is a little bit disturbed, but we see overall time to cross the border, how it is going on, and then it's distribution in gender age groups, some other operational attributes, waiting time, response time of the technology with different travelers. Then their uh, combination with acceptance score, that how they are impacting the acceptance score then user perceptions, uh, how user feels about different aspects of using technology like speed, malfunctioning, UI design during their experience, sentiment, emotions, their uh, distributions into other attributes, nationality, gen gender, age, 
then overall technology acceptance with the based on the nationality over in mean value then its combination with other attributes then we also had some open text for the travelers to say something about their experience and feedback and we visualize this these those words that what they are talking about for their experiences and here comes the critical part where we are also showing the performance of the social sensing toolkit so we know that acceptance with four or five it's fine we are good at it but the more people at predicting for those people who are at risk like for acceptance level 1 or 2 so in terms of this thing we can say uh, that uh, for one out of uh, this 31 data points 23 were predicted correctly from the social sensing toolkit with the data that we collected from the pilot so overall this confusion matrix on average presents the uh, 82% and then we have also impact of these different attributes on the prediction score as well so this is how we visualize this thing and the next thing in the dashboard we also try to see through this explainable ai model that we designed for social sensing toolkit so this is also enhanced with real data and we can see the authorities or the stakeholders can see what features are actually impacting uh, the decisions at current time stamp and then they can focus on that uh, feature especially for improving it in terms of the acceptance and furthermore if any of the data point or any of the data they want to go into more detail they can also see that how is for a specific data point where they are interested which feature are contributing in terms of positive and negative for predicting the score and then the necessary measures for improving the model prediction can be taken so finally i will just uh, go with uh, can you go back to the presentation so this is a snapshot of one of the scenarios that we implemented in uh, any logic simulation tool and we are performing let's say the travelers are entering with some arrival rate with some number of travelers entering into the environment and the next thing that i uh, that we want to show is here this thing actually so this is how we have these graphs so let's say we have one operational attribute at each this is response time this is waiting time this is queue length this is overall time to cross the border and this curve is the predicted acceptance score so we deployed the real model trained on the real data into the simulation environment and now you run it with your values with your numbers and see if you change anything so how this curve is changing with each of these and then you can understand that how uh, you should improve the technology acceptance more for uh, for your purpose at this specific bcp or in general so i think Yeah that's end <laughs> thank you so much thank you very much sule thank you very much sarang uh, it was indeed really a great presentation quite interesting let's proceed with iccs and our colleagues georgia joka and christos lekarakos who are going to present us the data analytics framework of uh, the medicos platform thank you very much hello everyone good morning i hope I, I just want to share that I'm really excited to be here uh, with you today and to present our work uh, together with the rest of the colleagues, of course. My name is Georgia Joker and I come from ICCS and I will be presenting uh, why we used big data and how uh, basically big data are a core uh, of the Medicos platform, how we utilize them, the techniques that we used and uh, the module that we have developed. So the role of big data and data analytics in Medicos is first of all to collect and harmonize data that come from heterogeneous sources. Our colleagues already mentioned some of these sources, such as social media data, uh, questionnaires, data operational data from uh, pilots, uh, offline data that we gathered from our colleagues from BCPs, etc. So all of these sources are heterogeneous, and they use different uh, types, such as structured or unstructured, textual. Uh, ratings, um, some, some on different scales. So to harmonize of this, to develop a, a data model that we actually used also data to, to develop it. Um, and then to provide a portfolio, a suite of different machine learning, statistical algorithms, in addition to some uh, methods uh, of exploratory data analytics in order to uncover patterns, uh, gain insights, Um, about uh, the efficiency and the acceptance of smart border control technologies. And of course, what else? To expose these results to our...
users so uh, they can actually get the value out of uh, this analysis that we perform. So why uh, the big data and data analytics? Basically, the, what's the innovation uh, that we uh, feel our module has provided to uh, Medicos as a whole, and of course, Medicos as a whole project, is to provide a comprehensive and a transparent data analysis in the sense that uh, we would integrate uh, AI techniques stemming from uh, predictive analytics, but also simpler analytics uh, using cross-tabular statistics and um, exploratory data analytics methods in both uh, structured and unstructured data. And in that sense, uh, ensure that these diverse data sets are used uh, to gain insights uh, across all uh, different pilot sites and across um, the different heterogeneous uh, sources that we have. And uh, our, another innovation that we, we feel that we provided to the project was that we have incorporated some bias identification and mitigation techniques to ensure uh, that uh, the decision making is done in a fair way, that we provide equitable and fair results, and thus ensure trustworthiness uh, among the system uh, that has, of course, uses AI, uh, which sometimes can be considered as a black box, to our end users in a more uh, discernible way so that people understand why a decision has been made, why the model has taken, um, made this prediction, basically. Uh, and of course, this is done on real time, um, in a real time and an offline way. Uh, how uh, we feel that we serve the medical system uh, through, as I mentioned before, this suite of dedicated machine learning algorithms uh, and data analytics methods and uh, the framework that we have provided for this analysis of heterogeneous data. Another thing that I um, probably did not m m um, mention here is the uh, data model uh, that we developed as part of Medicos. And uh, to our understanding, it was the first time that it was uh, produced. It's an available data model for the acceptance of smart border control technologies. I can provide more information about this later. And that we also used a hybrid approach to produce uh, this data model through, of course, the more traditional knowledge-based way, but also through a data-driven way where we compiled a large data set uh, of text uh, data and uh, extracted the keywords and the most important things, uh, topics, in order to be able to produce uh, this hybrid uh, model available for use not just for medicals, but of course, maybe for the whole domain. So our data analytics framework is based on four different pillars. Uh, as I mentioned before, we use a structured, um, a pipeline that is uh, destined for structured data. So operational data, questionnaire data, where as our output, we can produce uh, trends, correlations, predictive analytics, and more things that we will be showing you, uh, my colleague Christos will be presenting afterwards through the dashboard. Second of all, the unstructured pipeline, where we use, uh, as it goes without saying, textual uh, data set. And from that, we're able to detect sentiment, subjectivity, topics, uh, keywords, named entities, whether that means organizations or people that come up in the text. Um, Another uh, key pillar is the bias uh, identification and mitigation measures, because uh, I think my colleagues before mentioned, we use, uh, of course, anonymous data, but some uh, protected attribute data, such as the age or the gender, uh, which can be uh, considered um, quite important in maintaining a, a fair way of, um, we need to make sure that we treat the algorithm, this, um, these attributes, um, in order to produce uh, the insights. So we uh, produce some BIOS metrics and we also offer, as part of this platform, some mitigation algorithms, both in the pre-processing stage, um, in the stage of um, processing the data set, but also pre-processing in terms of algorithms and post-processing as well. And finally, the visualization part is a crucial part of our framework since basically we uh, show the outcome of the analytics that we have performed in all the three different pillars. And of course, we will be showing you, so I will not uh, waste time talking about it. Regarding the technical implementation of our components, uh, you can see that we use some uh, cutting edge technologies very uh, used uh, in, uh, at the moment uh, by the domain, of course, and by also uh, AI 
um, other methods. So at the bottom part, you can see the data layer and the different uh, data sources that we use. I will not spend so much time talking about this. Then, of course, we have the pre-processing stage, the data model that I mentioned before. Um, the big data analytics engine is the core, and we use various uh, Python libraries to ensure uh, that we uh, treat all the, these three different pillars that I mentioned before. And finally, the visualization part is also built in an iterative way based on the, res uh, the um, results of each pilot and based on the needs of our users. Uh, and um, basically, all of this is built uh, using Docker uh, and uh, fully integrated with the Meticos middleware um, and can be used also by um, our fellow um, partners. So regarding the unstructured data pipeline, maybe this is a bit too technical, but what I would, I would like you to take uh, as part of this is basically the outputs that our system is able to, to produce uh, and the fact that we also have used uh, as, a, um, as, a data, as our framework is able to work with multilingual data. So we also use language detection, we translate it into English and then the, the rest of the uh, pre-processing and modeling steps are pretty straightforward and used in many other applications in AI, so I will not go into detail about this, but the output basically would be a sentiment classification if we have positive, negative, or neutral, we have a score. Um, we use also some, um, we use BERT uh, and we use TextBlob, let's say, to uh, actually get uh, results regarding the sentiments. Then uh, something that is of interest to us is in which context uh, is this text um, or this sentiment, let's say, produced? Uh, what are they talking about? Uh, basically the topics and finally the, the key phrases of a specific text and we feel that uh, out of these results we can get some insights from uh, the specific uh, data set. Regarding the structured data pipeline, uh, in the left you just see a pretty straightforward uh, way uh, that is used currently in many domains in the AI. Um, just uh, after getting the data, of course, we explore the data, pre-process, select the most important features, uh, of course, evaluate, validate, build the model itself, uh, validate, evaluate, see if there has been a shift during uh, time, and of course, then the most important is to present the insights to the stakeholders uh, in an understandable way. Uh, we provide four also different types of uh, models. We have the descriptive ones, which uh, contain um, data filtering, contain uh, aggregations so that we can compare, let's say, uh, data sets that come from different pilot sites. That is something that we included in the dashboard as well, so that the policymaker, it's easy for them to see, for instance, in which uh, type of border, let's say the land border or the airport, uh, the acceptance is better, or based on the age, uh, nationality, uh, cultural background, frequency, what are the differences? So this, of course, goes with the first, um, with, with the, the person perspective. Of course, we include other types of data sets, such as operational data, the time to cross the border, if there has been a delay in a specific flight. Um, also, uh, we have sometimes series given to us by uh, BCPs, uh, so that we're able to um, to expect a specific number of people on a specific day. Let's say. So um, it's also part of these um, of these specific categories of data. We do also have uh, classifiers. Uh, we also uh, have deep learning models. We have employed some neural networks uh, for deep learning and regressor regressors, uh, which means that we are able to produce also a, a score, let's say, um, that is con continuous and not just a binary rating based on zero or one. Of course, it really depends on. Um, the output that are the users need, and we are able to, to have this framework that is able to produce such outputs for our end users. As I mentioned before, since we're also dealing with quite sensitive attributes such as age, gender, uh, nationality, it, it was very important uh, for us, uh, and we, we believe in general that it's crucial for AI systems to be able to provide some bias, at least identification, and if possible, some mitigation measures in order to, um, to be able to, to provide a, a fair, let's say, representation, both of the data set, but also of the algorithms used. Uh, and uh, that way we were able to build more trust, trustworthy systems, uh, so that uh, the, the people, the, the end users of the system finally uh, know that they can trust the system, they are able to 
um, to, to ensure the representativeness across the, our data sets. So for this reason, we have used uh, a tool which is already available and quite used uh, in not just the domain, but also in various applications. It's called the AI Fairness 360. It's a Python uh, package and it includes a comprehensive set of metrics, uh, both for datasets and for models, to test and detect biases. Um, and, uh, of course, to mitigate afterwards with some specific uh, algorithms, either in the pre-processing, uh, in-processing or post-processing stage. These are some bias metrics that we have included. I uh, don't think it's, it's a bit maybe too technical to go into this. And apart from the, the bias identification and mitigation pipeline, we have also included some explainability metrics, which we believe is crucial because uh, we need to make sure to understand why a model actually uh, gives this kind of results and these predictions. Uh, else, it will be considered as a black box. People may be afraid of it and may not even use it. So for this reason, we have employed two tools. Uh, the one is called Lime, and its purpose is basically to kind of zoom in a specific sample in order to get, um, to get some information about the important features and understand why this prediction happened at a specific stage. So basically what it does is it's trying to uh, approximate um, to, to zoom in a specific, let's say, sample using a simpler model and try to recreate um, the, the features and the outputs so that the users understand why the prediction was done in that way. And we have also used uh, SHAP. Uh, it's also a Python package that um, the purpose is basically to understand the importance of each individual feature in the final output. And I think it's time for Christos to, to show you also the dashboard. Thank you, Georgia. Hello, I'm uh, Chris Lagarakos. Along with Georgia, we developed the BDA dashboard of the Medicos project. Uh, the development was based on uh, iterative, uh, agile uh, development methodologies. Uh, we tried to utilize the user feedback uh, and the stakeholders' feedbacks as much as possible in order to come up with a with a, with a user-friendly solution. Uh, the system requirements, as you can see, was a modular design, uh, user-friendliness, simply and easy to scale, interactive and engaging. Uh, for this reason, we employed uh, the, the solution of Streamlink along with Plotly Visualization Library. I'll start with the Plotly Library first. Uh, Plotly is a very known library which is... Uh, uh, which is uh, available in many languages like JavaScript, Python, and a lot more. Uh, we, we selected it because it provides various deployment options, uh, offers a wide range of charts, uh, which is very important, uh, hands large data efficiently, and provides an extensive set of customization options. Uh, at first, we used the uh, uh, Flask, but uh, later, uh, by utilizing the feedback of the of the users, we decided to, to choose Streamlink as the main framework for the visualization uh, for the visualization part as our front end, to be exact. Uh, Streamlink is uh, kind of a recent uh, framework. It's developed in the last uh, four three years, but it's very known in the domain. Uh, it's specifically designed for data science applications. Uh, the advantage uh, comparing to Flask is that uh, it automates tasks a lot more uh, and uh, it helped us to, uh, to employ the agile methodologies uh, as, is very, as is very well suited for prototyping and it offers a wide, uh, wide variety of highly interactive features. Now we will see a demo of the dashboard. So, as you can see, the basic functionality of the BDA engine is, uh, is built around the select box where each option represents data from different sources. Now we're seeing the first tab, uh, which is about the operational data questionnaire. Uh, at the top, there are infographics about the key insights regarding the acceptance. Uh, in the first graphs, the user is able to explore the acceptance through different uh, demographic aggregations, like gender, age, nationality. Uh, 
while uh, now we even see a sunburst chart, we use this because it provides very deep insights. Um, as you can see, all graphs are highly interactive. The user is able to zoom, is able to select uh, areas of interest. And uh, now we'll see the second tab. It's about the technology acceptance uh, questionnaire. Uh, here, uh, similarly to the first page, at the top there are information about the, uh, the, in, the key insights regarding an acceptance. Uh, in the, below we see aggregations, like the first page, which is about gender, age, and nationality. We even see correlation matrix, which is uh, very useful because the user can explore potential relationships between variables through the correlation matrix. Now we'll see the police operational data tab. This tab is about uh, the data that each unit was able to select during the, the project. So as you can see, the user selected each tab and was able to choose the country of his choice. The same logic is applied into the pilot cases tab. Here we have uh, organized it in different uh, tabs. So the first tab is the overview of the project. The user can see all the data about the pilot cases, and the rest of the tabs are, are separated for each pilot case. You'll see at the top that there were five pilot cases, as you can see. Uh, so the user was able to explore visualizations about the, the ratings, of course, of the acceptance, the technologies employed in each uh, pilot, as well as the sentiment the user had about the potential technologies. We also employed sunburst charts here because we wanted to show the, the relationship between the technology type and the sentiment of its user. And the last tab uh, is the words analysis tab. It's what George explained about the analytics, uh, about bias and explainability in each, uh, uh, in each uh, graph and each algorithm employed. Uh, our goal was to provide the user with a very uh, easy to use dashboard so uh, everyone uh, so anyone would be able to explore the data with his own uh, uh, in his own personalized fashion uh, to understand the relationships and the impact that its data had on the project and that uh, that was the demo it stopped sorry i didn't uh, <laughs> see it uh, so, that was uh, that was all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christos. And we have to change the slide and again, and we can proceed with an overview presentation of an overview presentation of the pilot implementation by our dear friends. Uh, from Johanniter, so Jörg, Benjamin, Hannes, Marie, uh, who, to, to whom should we? Super. Yes, just give us a second to put you on the speakers so that the rest of the partners can hear you. So, hello, my name is Hannes Erwin, I'm from Estonian Police and Polegard Board. We will present uh, with uh, Johanniter. Jörg is there. Also, Marie Garrick, uh, Mrs. Marie Garrick also there. If there is any questions, uh, they can answer right there. But I will present from Thailand. So, next slide, please. Uh, we proceeded a long-running uh, planning period. It uh, lasts about one uh, year. And uh, main core of, uh, of this address are uh, um, standard scenarios. This is a standard scenarios uh, were done. Also, standard uh, uh, conducting uh, testing conducting solution was done. It was core. Uh, we it, there was approximately six uh, uh, scenarios per country, positive uh, scenario and negative scenario. But we we, we also adopted uh, these scenarios for. Uh, specific countries and specific needs. For example, in Moravita, Romania, uh, uh, we applied uh, um, uh, these needs, what they, they were there. For example, there wasn't uh, any ABC gates in land uh, 
uh, border crossing points. So we uh, came to this true uh, with uh, VR testing solution. And next slide, please. And uh, main information about the uh, web package 10. It was leaded by Johaniter. It was done well. Action was truly planned, and results are uh, results are achieved. We had uh, 14 participants and uh, four law enforcement agencies from Estonia, Greece, Cyprus, uh, Romania, and Austria. And uh, the focus was uh, in piloting in border authorities uh, context. Uh, we piloted ABC gates, uh, dashboards, data, uh, data modeling, uh, technology acceptance modeling. And yes, we tested, we had five tests in uh, four airports. Yes, we tested there, but yes, we didn't test airplanes. So only tested ABC gates and dashboards. Also was uh, done uh, trainings. We had uh, two big training sessions. Uh, three workshops, two physical, one and one, one online. Next slide, please. And as I said, five countries, five deaths, about uh, uh, 20 players uh, per country. So we ha had uh, 100 players there. Mm, as a rule, the players were police cadets. But for example, in Moravita, uh, we had uh, own offices. 20 officers from uh, border crossing point. And the logic behind the timing of this test was as follows. Uh, the, at first training, then test, then workshop, then uh, next upskilling planning workshop in Vienna, what we had, a new test summary, and summary have done in, in, in online workshop. In, and in this video, you can see Tallinn workshop. Can you switch it on? No, no. Go back, please. And please switch video on. You must click to the last. No, back. One, one back. One slide back. Yes. Click on it. Yes. And at the right side, you can size to the screen. So it was first uh, workshop, and uh, you can see in the left side uh, we had also uh, 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 technological accept, uh, acceptance modeling, but we had uh, uh, with questionnaires. Next slide, please. Uh, first, the pilot uh, we had in Tallinn in January, there was uh, uh, four parts. First one was uh, virtual reality test. Uh, second one was measurement uh, of technology acceptance for the driver documents application, and we used eye tracking. Uh, third one was physical test with eye tracking and passing uh, through ABC gates and kiosk using dashboard also. And last one was filling out a questionnaire about uh, border control in a tablet, but we, ha we have seen uh, last uh, slide. We had 21 students, real staff in kiosk, control kiosk. Uh, ABC gates uh, were switched in training mode. Uh, there was no connection to the live bases. Uh, ABC gates uh, uh, checks uh, have, uh, were done with uh, training uh, from training bases with real chips, uh, specimen documents in specimen documents six posi positive scenarios, six negative scenarios, and as I said already, workshops, physical, online, and interviews. Next slide, please. Uh, in Tallinn, uh, can you please uh, click on the, uh, uh, to the, no, this is Moravita, but up one, yes, yes, yes. And you can oversize also this uh, this video, the right side of this uh, video. The right side, you can see there is a VR test, ongoing VR test. 
And next, uh, next video, please. Uh, this is a kiosk, as you see, player, which is Kadet, is wearing this eye uh, tracking glasses. At the right side is uh, our dashboard, medical system, uh, switched on and working. And the lower video, what we had in Moravita, Romania, it was already the second uh, iteration, but I will talk about it a little bit later. It was full-scale uh, virtual reality uh, test with both sides uh, eye tracking classes. It was interesting for us, advanced test. Next slide, please. And this is an overall view. Uh, we started in January, and last test was in Vienna airport in, in August. And uh, all pilots had uh, have had uh, VR training. No, no, sorry. We are training to Tallinn, Vienna. We had in all sides several scenarios, including VR scenario. And in every test site was tested technology acceptance was very important for us. And used was eye tracking classes. Next slide, please. We had excellent times, uh, teams in Atoms. Everything was a swift, a swift planning, good team, excellent team. Uh, they had uh, nine scenarios in Athens. Uh, we tested, applied four scenarios. Uh, for example, the first one was the border crossing process for cities and CU. Second one was uh, border crossing process uh, for uh, third country nationals uh, with different problems, with different uh, uh, um, behave scenarios. Next sli slide, please. And uh, as I said, our scenarios were general. Uh, uh, yeah, and in Larnaca, it was a uh, kind of mirror uh, from, uh, uh, from Athens. There was uh, four scenarios. First one was uh, ABC, ABC gate uh, pass with specimen passport. Second one was manual check with various fake passwords. And last one was uh, last two one was uh, technological, technological acceptance, website, kiosk, IBC gates. And uh, what was interesting in Larnaca, there is, uh, at the airport, there is no ABC gates, but uh, uh, there is a local solution border called uh, Border Express. It was very interesting for us to test this, to, uh, to, to use this scenario also for this uh, solution. And next slide, please. Moravita uh, in Romania. It was different because it was in uh, uh, land uh, border crossing point. There was no, no ABC gates. Or there was no use the cadets, only uh, professional persons, uh, officers from uh, border crossing points. And uh, it was full uh, virtual reality test. Uh, there was uh, five, uh, three scenarios. They used both side classes for uh, players and for officers. And first scenario was uh, for a situation uh, using ABC gates. And as I said, there was no ABC gates, so they played it in virtual mode. Uh, second one was for officers to check how uh, how behave these officers in in check uh, in checking solution when the officer is checking the documents and last one was uh, was a virtual scenario uh, and it simulates natural disaster at border it was a fire accident at, at border crossing point and next slide it's uh, porky or georg are you there give uh, for the Vienna pilot, we summarized the scenarios that we had before tested uh, and the latest updated version of the Medicos dashboard that was integrated. And by this, we did the, did the scenario tests as we did in comparison to Athens and Larnaca and Tallinn uh, as an airport test. That's actually it. <laughs> Next slide. Yes, I can do it in here. 
So if we start the videos, we, we did once the eye tracking and the virtual reality testing. Uh, and here, first you can see from the border guard perspective with the eye tracking. Yes, it works. So we could see, whenever you see one of these green dots that can even get red, uh, this is where the person is looking at, at, where the focus is of the eyesight, and by this we can follow what has the person seen, uh, how long has he looked at a certain point. Uh, we have also a blinking detection in it, uh, which means we can see when the person gets fatigued. And by this we have a very good impression how long a border guard can work in his position with the concentration that is necessary, if he's seeing everything that he needs to see, uh, and where is the, the point of focus when a person is approaching him. Uh, we also did this because one side is nice, two sides are nicer. <laughs> uh, here we have it for the traveler perspective, for the traveler perspective as well. Uh, so we have a first briefing, uh, this is from Tallinn here. Uh, first briefing of the passenger uh, where to go to the gate and you can see uh, how the passenger is orienting in the, in the area when he's reading the suggestions how to use the ABC, approaching the ABC, orienting again, here they see the interaction model, here is the face recognition, position check, again can you see me, can I see me, is it the right person that is showing up? <laughs> Um, you can even see here a little bit of the glasses, uh, then you get the identification and then you can pass. So we have the chance to see here if the traveller is also using it in the way it is proposed to be used, how it is suggested to be used. Or uh, if they do not see the instructions or if they get lost and where they get lost. So you, need to, uh, so you know as an airport or as the police service where to put your support stuff at the right position. Otherwise, if they are too far away, it takes more time, etc. blah, blah, blah. So this is something that we could do with that. And finally, for the virtual reality, we have a, a video demonstration here as well. Trying to find it. It's easier to do it that way. Don't touch it. I can do it. Here we go. Um, so this is a replay from the virtual reality that we are doing. Uh, we have a test system here as well, so uh, all of the audience is welcome to do it. Uh, here you can see the lines on the floor, which means we see where the person has gone. Uh, this, is, uh, this is monitored, this is, uh, so to say, transcribed. We can use this information to see how the process, how the work is going on. So if the, if the border guard always has to look over here and then goes back here, it takes an awful lot of time and this is also there. So we can see if the processes that we have to do with this system are aligned with the efficiency potential. The same way uh, and the same thinking is for the, for the traveler as well. When the traveler is approaching the gate, we can see, is he seeing everything that is necessary? So at the right side, here on the, upper, on the upper area, you see the perspective of the traveler as well as of the border guard. So here as the operator perspective, you see both sides. Which means you always know what they have seen, you know where they have oriented it, and you see, have seen how they have moved. And by this we can take uh, some results for us, how to increase efficiency, where they have looked, how long, uh, what was the main indication for their so to say, flittering when they are walking around. And by this, we can put more efficiency to a border control process. So that was the main idea. And we had no problems with corona then. Okay, so that's it. Thank you. For the success story, uh, Hannes, I give back to you. We achieved the, the goals. We caught the tool, but uh, we can now discuss for uh, further enforcement, enforcing. It was very hard time for us uh, to work uh, uh, in Meticos because of COVID. There was, um, uh, but we, everything has done. And this video, you can, if you switch this video on, there we are running uh, three simultaneous uh, telcos in same time. And one telco is, uh, is in leading option. Uh, but as I said, we achieved the goals. 
what is important for uh, us is uh, this uh, VR uh, training and uh, VR solution. We can use this, probably this idea further. And very important is for us, uh, maybe new strategic objective. Uh, technological acceptance must be done uh, uh, before new uh, solutions are implemented or new solutions are changes. So we must use this uh, technological acceptance. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, these are uh, Georgs. Thank you very much. Uh, so we had a technical evaluation uh, done by our colleagues from Zimavi, uh, which has shown that every technical features that we needed to have is cleared. Uh, we had for the technology acceptance uh, model an evaluation of the thresholds. Uh, so what if we approach the border guards, what would be an acceptance for the stakeholders uh, as, a, as a mean? Uh, if it is below, it's troublesome. If it's in the mean, it's okay. If it's above, perfectly fine. So there was no data before uh, where we could orient that. So this is now directly uh, one of the results we have. And we had decision-maker workshops uh, where it's very clear to, uh, how we have to go forward, what would be the next step for a product development, and how we can implement it. And we have a clear idea of how the return of investment would work. So thank you very much. Hannes, any last words for this presentation? Uh, thank you. Any questions, please? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, we present here uh, our work uh, in detail, the models, how we extract the models. Unfortunately, in this project, we didn't have explosions or terrorist attacks or dirty bombs or collapses. But what we did is we tried to, uh, let's say, to dive deep in, uh, in the user uh, uh, from, the, from the border authority side, but also on the traveler side. We tried, let's say, to uh, simulate the reactions of both actors. Uh, also, we tried to, to model these reactions. I think that uh, we have suf uh, sufficient results for that. Uh, you, you saw some of these results, but also we will present in the near future more results. I don't know. What we are expecting today is, uh, let's say, a feedback from the agencies first, because we consider the agencies as, let's say, the, our first customers of the solution. This solution is something that, uh, uh, let's say, will support uh, the authorities to, let's say, contribute on these new technologies, because until now, uh, we are bringing technologies to the authorities, but we don't know. Uh, we are, and after that, in the second phase, we are trying to, let's say, motivate the authorities to use these technologies. We are trying to train them. So with this solution, uh, we are adding a fa uh, one phase before this uh, situation. Uh, it will be the evaluation phase, also from the agencies, but also for the local border authorities. Uh, and uh, will give them uh, the opportunity to test the solutions before uh, installing the solutions to their facilities. Uh, I don't have something additional to say. I think that it was a nice presentation. I would like to thank my partners and colleagues for this. Thank you very much, dear coordinator. Thank you very much to all the partners for achieving such a great uh, presentation. We have achieved a great milestone. We are very close to the coffee break. However, uh, it is maybe we could, we have to. So let's try for like five to ten minutes to open the floor, screen, mic, pretty much everything for uh, questions, remarks, ideas. And after that, to say that we have closed with the first of out of four sections of this final conference and then proceed to the coffee game break. So, any questions? Anyone that uh, who would like to add or ask something? I remember that uh, previously we had the question from the online participants. 
uh, so it was Giuseppe, I think, and it was for uh, AI, the AIT presentation. Would you like to, to make a question now? Or you would uh, yes. Good morning, if possible. Good morning. Uh, I, I took some uh, notes related to the presentation uh, on the online tool no? From, uh, that was on the Simavi website. Uh, I noticed that there, there were BCP data, uh, the, the menu BCP data. Uh, I wanted to ask if uh, such data are available, as we didn't see it. So just to ask if they are shareable uh, or if mm, are related to passengers flow or to uh, historical data on incident. Uh, this was the uh, first question. The second question is if the surveys uh, are also, uh, mm, there are some results on surveys related to border guards uh, to extract their point of view in terms of benefits uh, by using uh, uh, innovative uh, uh, um, biometric uh, technologies for uh, uh, border crossing point, uh, border crossing and checkpoints. And the other was related to the social sensing tool for NU, NTU, so N NTNU, I think, is. <laughs> and if the surveys on social media on Twitter, uh, the, essentially the, the acceptance score was the, based on the same technologies that, that are uh, used in the um, online surveys on the, the CIMAVI survey. I don't know if these were the notes, so. <laughs> Thank you for the questions. Thank you very, very much. Uh, so we have AIT and NTNU. Shall we start with NTNU? Yes. So let's. Thank you very much. I, I think the question is about this 8,000 data collected in the survey. If we used it in the social sensing toolkit, we have created two versions of the social sensing toolkit where in one we did not explicitly use the data but we used the model AIT used as a proxy model uh, to create another score that is available uh, and in the version we presented we do not have it but we have made some experiments and also confirmed that uh, our results from the social sensing toolkit comply with the results uh, from the 8,000 travelers survey from AIT. So it is used and tested, but the model presented today does not include that. Sorry, I didn't get the question. <laughs> I was not here. On the online tool, there is the tab uh, BCP data that I think are, uh, is available only when the user is logged in because I noticed that in the online version, uh, if I'm not logged in, I cannot see the, the menu BCP data. I think it's border control, border checkpoints uh, data. Uh, Maybe they are some internal data of the pro to the project. The, the the modules are yes they, they are available only for the logged in user uh, but I guess we can make the login available. To understand which is the data model that is behind or the data the types of data that yes that are collected essentially. Well, in, in in the first part of the application, the data which is used they come from the middleware, so the, those are the data collected by the travelers questionnaire. Uh, for the presentation purposes, now there is also a study data mixed in uh, because just for the, from the pilots or from the middleware, there is a very few data points available only. So I guess there is only like 14 data points or so. So currently, uh, to, to simulate the real data, we use also the data from the study, which, which, which are those 8,000 data points. For the middle part, it's all basically only simulated data, so it's it's generated in the application, so there you <coughs> made the assumptions. But those data points which are created synthetically, 
Those are sent to the ETAP module. So that's the model, that's the technology acceptance model. And the, the, those, the, the, the actual model is used to produce the, the acceptance uh, scores. And those are then reflected in the middle part of the application. As expected utilization of the technology. So there is a communication from the front to the middleware. And there is the actual model. There, there is the API for, for sending the, the data points, and you will get an answer as a, as a, as a acceptance score. And those are utilized then either in front of the application or in any part of the medical system uh, where it's needed. As, 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 as it was mentioned, it was used also in the social sensing toolkit. Okay, maybe we can we can have a, a, an off an offline uh, alignment if possible to understand better which 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 type of data because maybe I uh, just to explain better than when where I where I saw this kind of uh, uh, menu but uh, we can have a, an offline if you have time to to have an in deep discussion. Sure, no sure. problem. Super, thank you. Uh, One more so question. Yes, please. Yes. Um, I was, I mean, first, thank you all for the great presentation. It was uh, great to see the results from um, this project. Um, I was wondering, when you first came up with the idea of developing this type of platform, was this um, done in cooperation with uh, border authorities, with potential end users? So um, did this... Was this project born out of a need that was voiced by authorities? And the second part of the question is kind of um, with regard to potential uptake after the pilots. Um, how, I mean, how likely did it seem for the border authorities that you worked with that they would like to have such a platform um, in, in, in place? And was there any variation between the different countries where you were um, doing the pilots? Has to be addressed to you. Uh, yes, uh, we, when we prepare this proposal, we have, let's say, a discussion with the end users. And uh, we identify the problem. Uh, the main issue was on the forthcoming, let's say, AI tools that, uh, let's say, will be deployed on the borders and not on the existing tools. On the other hand, uh, uh, I had and we have experience as travelers eh? and uh, regarding, let's say, our interactions with such tools. Personally, I... Uh, I, if I, I remember that uh, uh, I have problems in many APCs, maybe I'm not sure if me it's, if I if I have let's say if I don't have the sufficient intelligence to uh, pass the test, eh, or there is problem on the APCs uh, themselves. Eh, them, I, I mean that they don't provide sufficient uh, instructions. So uh, the thought is that uh, if I have problem. Because I'm considering myself as an educated engineer, uh, then I cannot, uh, let's say, imagine the problem that other uh, population, other uh, persons will have uh, that are not, uh, they don't have any engineering expertise or they don't have any interaction with such technology. So it was a combination between uh, uh, the request we have from the border authorities, but also from our side as a person, as travelers. Uh, on the other hand, it seems that there is interest now, not only from the border authorities that are involved in the project, but also from Flodex. Uh, and EU Lisa, I mean that there are discussions, mainly with Flodex, but also it seems that uh, it is... Uh, it, it seems that it is a requirement. We need tools, not uh, for, uh, first for training the, the staff, the border authorities, but also, on the other hand, 
for trying to uh, measure somehow the acceptance of these components. Now, I'm, I'm not aware about the, uh, the value of interest between the, the border authorities, but maybe, I don't know, York, because you, you interact with all border authorities. Do you have any uh, dimension of interest? I mean, we have more interest from the Austria part, but <laughs> no interest for another party. Do you remember? Yeah, so in general, the feedback was quite good that we got for Meticos. Um, still, there is a long way to go for a product that could be sold. But the interest also for developing with us uh, as a team further on this uh, is quite high. Thank you. Great. So I was left without the microphone, but in any case. Any other questions, uh, remarks? Otherwise, I would be very happy to, you know, to say that state that we have the right and the obligation and uh, and uh, the privilege to proceed to the very coffee break. So thank you very much. Thank you very much to all. We can go outside for a coffee break. And uh, after 15 minutes, we can, 20, I'm informed, we can come back and proceed with the first panel of, of the Medicos final conference. Thank you.